morning, church. Good to be with you this morning. I hope you're having a good morning, and if you're not, you're in the right place, because uh, we are going to focus on God this morning, and we're going to focus on listening to Him, how He speaks, and how He moves us. We have many things to celebrate this morning. You're going to be seeing them up on the, on the screens as we worship through music. So as we go into this time, I encourage, I invite you to worship our great God with us the one that makes old things new, the one that remakes things that are broken and makes them better than they ever were before. And I, I get to be one of those things just like you do when we start this relationship with Christ. So as we go into this time of worship, church, let's worship together. this life, but sending your son as our redeemer to redeem our lives, to be able to turn them back to you and to focus on you for how we live and how we love. 
God, we know that you love in big ways, and we want to love just like that. May our love be as fierce as yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
so kind to me. Coming 
Let's give a hand. That was uh, Tyler and Abby Harriman. You saw Tammy Craig, Jeremy Harper, Andy Davis, Cooper Fitz, Sky Watson, Ashton Breen, and Selena Emerson. Amen. Those, uh, those people and more have decided, hey, we're going we're gonna to take this uh, walk with Christ and we're going to make this personal. We're going we're gonna to allow him and Jesus' blood to cover us and allow us to be new. And, and they're pledging to say, you know, we're going to try to walk every single day looking more like Christ and looking less like me all the time. And that's what it's about. It's, it's whether you're a seasoned Jesus follower and you've been around for a long time and you've been dedicated in your walk or it's your first day. Maybe you haven't even opened yourself up to the reality of God and his presence and his, his wanting and his desire to, to guide you and to fill your heart. To allow you to have hope and peace and freedom from all that crap in your life that you have fought so hard to try to remove. God can do that. God's power is great enough to do that. His love is deep enough to bury all those ugly things and to never be found again so that you and I can live free. Uh, it's a matter of us choosing every single day, whether you're brand new or you've been doing this for a while, to say, you know what? Following Jesus is about following it's about, it's an, it's an action kind of thing. It's a verb. It's about you reading his word, coming to know him, coming to know his heart, talking to him, but listening to him because he will guide you. It's a matter of you saying, you know what? At this moment, I want you to build my life. We've all had the opportunities to build our life before we came into a relationship with Christ. And I don't know if you built your house on sand or you build it on rock but God has got something special in store for you he's, he's, got, he's got desires just for you, gifts just for you that you can use to help build his kingdom but it starts with you saying I will build my life on him song we could ever sing You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Just the name above every other name. 
So the ground might shake, the environment might move, but when we build our life on Him, we can trust that no matter what happens, He's with us, He'll guide us. He's promised He's never going to leave us alone and say, oh man, that's way too bad for me. He always promises to be exactly where we are. He's already in front of us. He's been where, we're, where we haven't been. And just, that's just how incredible our God is. It's because of his love, motivated by love. So, his love caused him to move. His compassion on us caused him to move and to, to change his mind. Whereas our sins and all the crap that we do when we strive to live like him, but yet we go back and live like ourselves, really condemns us. But God was so moved with love that he decided that things should change. And so he sent his son as a sacrifice to end all sacrifices. He sent his son to live wrapped in human skin to go through life as we do fully God but yet also fully human to show the world what love looks like and what love sounds like and how love acts and then God would ultimately use his son as the sacrifice the, the sacrificial lamb so his blood would be spilled so ours didn't have to be. He took our punishment so we didn't have to be. But because of the death and the resurrection life of Christ, we don't have to think about this being the end. This being the end. The presence of God in our lives is going to take us from this side to heaven. Because of love. So we take time out of the service every time we get together to participate in a little bit of an object lesson. It's just to remind us of the sacrifice of Christ. A little piece of bread is to remind us of his, his body that was broken, beat up, abused but also his body that just loved to serve. Woke up every morning with selfish motivation to go out and rock the world in a way they've never seen. And he did that. The little cup of juice is to remind us of his blood, the blood that was spilled and shed on the cross, splattered when he was beaten. But that blood is also to remind us of the blood that just pumped through his veins keeping him moving and motivated for others. So when you take this little object lesson and you eat it, drink it, we remember the death. So we die to ourselves, but we remember his life and allow his life that was lived for others to motivate us to do the same, starting right here, right now. Would you pray with me? You are so good. God, you are so good. You're so good to us. We are humbled by your love. But it's also exciting. It reminds us that we have the opportunity to absolutely live for you, to give it all to die to ourselves just so we can identify more with Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the hope. 
We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. So we are kicking off this new series um, today um, called Hit the Books. And this is one of the, um, it's probably the only series that we repeat. This is the only one that we, we do every single year. We always do this um, right as school's getting ready to start. And uh, usually what we do is we take a book of the Bible and we just spend a few weeks going through that book of the Bible or, or a few times we've taken a person in the Bible and we've spent some weeks studying it. What we're doing um, this year, this time, is we're just taking um, just a passage out of the Bible, just three chapters that we wanna focus on the next few weeks. And it's from Matthew chapter five, chapter six, and chapter seven. And this is called the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is believed, uh, it kind of just everybody agrees that this is probably the most famous collection of teachings of Jesus. Um, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. You know why it's called Sermon on the Mount? Because he preached it from a mountain. That's the only reason they call it the Sermon on the Mount. No significance whatsoever uh, to the name, but what makes this uh, teaching, this sermon so significant is what Jesus says in these three chapters. See, up to this point, as we go through this, as, you, as we go through some of these verses in the next uh, few weeks, 
All of this stuff here is, is brand new stuff. These are uh, things that people had never heard before. This is um, stuff that the, the religious system, uh, Judaism at that time, they didn't teach these things. They didn't practice this. It surely wasn't a part of their society. And so Jesus comes into the picture and he brings this new way of thinking, this new way of living. And so before we jump into chapter five, where the Sermon on the Mount starts, you got to go back to chapter four to see kind of what leads up to this. See, before you get to the Sermon on the Mount, you see that Jesus had just started his ministry, that he just started traveling around and he was preaching and he was teaching and he was loving people and he was healing people and he's gaining this large group of followers that everywhere he went, this group of followers was right behind him. And when you read in the book of Matthew, Matthew makes it a point to tell us the kind of people that flock to Jesus. Matthew said that these crowds were made up of the poor, of the sick, of the hurting, made up of people that are just the, the, the laborers that are barely making ends meet, people that are, are broken, people that would be considered outcasts. These were people um, that were living under Roman rule. They were living in a Roman society. And, and the Romans, they, were, they did do some good things. They, more people had clean water than ever before. So living under Roman rule, living in a Roman society, you got to experience actually having clean water. Um, there was peace in the land. They, they weren't, there was no wars. Um, the Romans were known for building roads, so travel was a lot easier. But the problem with the Roman society and living under Roman rule, where we find all these people that we're going to you know, be reading about, Rome was great for the wealthy, for the prestigious, but for the poor and the down and out, um, living in this kind of society, this was a, a difficult place to live. And so we have these outcasts, you know, uh, outcasts of the Roman society, but they're also outcasts amongst the religious, amongst the, the Jewish people. And so Jesus is traveling and Jesus is teaching, and it's these kind of people that are drawn to him. It's this group of people that are drawn to the things that Jesus is saying. It's the things, the way Jesus treats them is what's bringing these people to him. And so before Jesus walks up onto the mountain to be able to deliver this um, teaching, this Sermon on the Mount, he, he relays his core message to these people. And it's summarized, uh, kind of summarizes the, everything Jesus teaches. And it's found in Matthew four seventeen. And this is probably a verse that, that you've heard before, that you've seen before. It says, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this verse, like, I don't know what comes to mind for you, but when I read this verse, I kind of get like the image of like the guy on the street corner, right? Like the guy that's holding up the sign, like repent, the kingdom is near, um, yelling at people. Um, kind of like, you know, if, the same with a lot of people that, that yell and spew hatred, they often, you know, misuse some Bible verses. Um, And this is one of those verses that when I read it, I think, ah, man, like I just picture that guy yelling. When Jesus said this, he was saying something totally different. Something brand new that people had never heard. This word right here for repent, I've talked about this before, it's metanoia. Meta, like metamorphosis, it means change. Noia, like paranoia, means thinking. So Jesus, when he says repent, what he's actually saying here is you guys need to change your thinking. This phrase that has been told um, to people that, you know, yelled at to say, change your lives before, you know, the end is near, all this stuff. Jesus is actually saying, hey, guys, I need you to change your thinking Because I know that you're used to living under this like Roman kingdom with all of its rules and all of its laws. And I know that you're, you're living under this like Jewish kind of system and it has its own rules and its own laws and own legalism. And he's saying, I need you to start changing your thinking about everything you know, because I'm gonna show you this new way to live. He's talking about this kingdom and all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about establishing this new kingdom. This kingdom that's unlike anything that anyone has ever seen before. This kingdom with no armies, with no weapons, with no taxes, with no big spectacles or displays. And so this is the Sermon on the Mount, introducing this new kingdom. But before you can experience this kingdom, you've got to start changing the way that you think. Have you ever had to change your opinion 
on somebody. Like you, the more you get to know them, your opinion changes, you start to change your thinking. Um, you know, I think about, you know, at school, how many kids just like, you want to pull your hair out, like they just drive you crazy. But then you start to get to know them. And you start to hear some of the stories and, and some of the, their home lives. And then you're, you, you start to change your thinking on these kids. And now all of a sudden, you're not looking at them as the kid that drives you crazy, but, you know, the kid that just needs, you know, a little extra attention. You know, this idea of changing your thinking, um, there's these artists, uh, Tim Noble and Sue Webster. I had, I had found them a while ago. And these guys are known um, for using trash. There's a picture up here. Um, so they have these big art displays and you can come into the museums and you, and you walk up and you see this and you're like, oh, it's one of those art things where everybody pretends that they know what it's, it's supposed to represent. And you know, you, you're like, oh, I get it. You know, it's whatever. And so they have these and they, they're, they're known for using trash. But the cool thing is, um, if you click at the next one, they'll, as you're watching, they turn a light on. And then all of a sudden, it goes from just being a pile of trash to being, you know, shadows that make up um, a bigger picture. There's another one here. This is my, my favorite piece of theirs. Um, this pile of trash, but then when the light comes on, you can see that there, there's homeless people laying behind it. And so... When you read about these two people, um, they say that their art is all about the reversal of perception and thinking. That you walk into these art shows and you're, you go and you start looking at a pile of trash, but then you leave once the light comes on. And then now you've reversed your thinking and your perception and now you walk away seeing some beauty and some meaning. So everything Jesus says up here in the Sermon on the Mount, he's trying to change everybody's perception and thinking. It's countercultural to the Jewish people that are listening to it, that are living under Roman rule. And it, it's just as countercultural to us today as Christians living in America. So countercultural. If you read the last verse of the Sermon on the Mount, this is Matthew 7 28. It says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings. This word amazed, ekplaso, means they were out of their minds. Like we would translate that as Jesus blew their minds with his teachings because this was all brand new stuff that they had never heard before. It reminds me of the show Stranger Things. Anybody watch all the Stranger Things show? It's not many. If you haven't watched Stranger Things, it's going to rain today. Go home and watch it. It's a great show. But if you've, if you've seen Stranger Things, you know what I'm talking about. Because um, in Stranger Things, there's this, this um, the upside down. Okay? You know what I'm talking about if you've seen the show. The upside down is kind of this alternate dimension. It's like the same as our world, but it's like opposite and different. And I feel like when you read the Sermon on the Mount, like it's, it's completely opposite of the way the world tells us to live. And so Jesus, this is the, the, the lesson he teaches on the mountain. You know, he could have taught the same lesson on the ground. You know, he, he was there at the bottom of the mountain. He tells them to repent. And then he turns and he walks up the mountain. And I, I think he's, he's, he's waiting to see. I think he's kind of telling the people, how bad do you want to follow me? If you really want to listen to me, we're going to walk up this mountain. And if you think walking up this mountain is hard and difficult, wait till you hear the things I say up there because it's going to be way harder to live this way. And so Jesus, he goes up on the mountain and he sits down. And any time when you read the Bible, when you see Jesus sit down, that means he's getting ready to deliver some serious teachings because that's what rabbis did. If they were going to teach with authority, they would sit down and everybody would gather around them and stand. And so Jesus sits down, surrounded by his disciples, by the sick, by the poor, the hurting, the broken, uh, surrounded by the outcasts that nobody you know, cares about. And Jesus starts off the Sermon on the Mount with something that we call the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, it revolves around this word, blessed. The, the word that Jesus uses is markarios, which means happy. Not just like a good mood, feel good, kind of happy, but, but kind of a, a special privilege. Like when you read through these, if you, instead of reading blessed, you could read this as privileged. Privileged are the poor in spirit. You know, privileged are those who mourn. And what he's saying here is if you want a better way to live, 
If you wanna experience more joy in your life than you've ever experienced, if you wanna experience contentedness in your life, if you wanna be a part of my kingdom, he says, here are some ways for you to live. And so the poor, the down and out, the ones that have been through some, through some serious crap, you know, here they sit and they're like, yes, we wanna be able to live a better life. We wanna live a, a happier life. And Jesus goes and he tells them, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So this is how he starts out. This is Jesus' uh, recipe for a happier, more joyful life. And so there's, there's three things I want to look at today. Um, to kind of dig into this of what these teachings are. The first is that these teachings, these teachings are paradoxical. Okay? Jesus often taught in paradoxes. Like these teachings are all about how to live a better, uh, more joyful life. And you, he, he tells people, hey, you want to live a blessed life? And everybody's like, yes, I would, you know, I, I would love that. And then he says, well, be poor in spirit, be merciful, be meek. You want a, a happier life? Then be insulted and persecuted. And you have to imagine all these people that, that hiked up that mountain and was there ready to listen to Jesus. And this is the first thing he said that probably a lot of people were whispering, like, Does this, I don't know if this guy is for real. Like, I don't think this guy has it all together. Like, this is how we're supposed to be happy. I imagine probably some people left and was like, there's no way I'm not listening to this guy because this, this doesn't even make sense. Because Rome, Rome taught to live a good life means to work hard, make money, buy things. The more you buy, the happier you are. And someday you can retire and you can enjoy all of your wealth, right? That's the, the same values that, that we kind of have as in America. And people struggled with these teachings of Jesus much like they do now. Because what Jesus teaches here is such a paradox from how the world tells us to live. The next thing is that these, um, these aren't just a paradox, these progress, meaning that these beatitudes are in a specific order. These, these are in a specific order and they're consecutive and, and you have to do one before you do the next one. It's kind of like the first step to a relationship with God and being part of the kingdom is you must make yourself poor in spirit. So what does it mean to be poor? It means that you're lacking something. So the first step to knowing God is, is realizing how much you need God. See, Judaism at that time was full of people that had it all together. They believed that God looked favorably on them because they were rich, because of how many possessions they owned. They, they felt like because they followed the rules that God um, loved them and, and was giving them all of this stuff. And Jesus turns this upside down and he says, no, it's the broken. It's the poor in spirit that are gonna see the kingdom of God. To get to that point where you realize, I have nothing without God. I'm poverty stricken because I'm a sinner. And then the next step after you get to that point is that you mourn. Meaning I'm spiritually broke. You realize how um, screwed up your life is. And you mourn because you realize how much of a mess you've made of your life. You mourn because you look around at the world and you say, how broken are people without Jesus? And once you come through that, you become meek. Meek means you are compliant. You're ready to follow God. You're submissive. You start to experience gentleness and humility. And then the next step, you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Meaning you want more of God. You want more of his teachings. You want more of what comes with following Jesus. And because of that, then you are merciful. You're pure in heart. You're a peacemaker. That, those three mean that you don't just mourn for the broken world and the broken people. You're actually out there helping and loving the broken people. And then we get down to the last one. And this is like the, I call it the big butt. This is the big butt. When you start living this way and you experience all of this stuff, then 
you might experience some persecution. You might experience some negativity in your life. I mean, this is a better way to live, but that's not necessarily an easier way to live. Like you're gonna be judged. You're gonna be persecuted for being different. You're gonna be insulted. Some of you know that when you turn your life to Jesus, that sometimes your friends and your family are gonna turn their backs on you. And Jesus says, but when these things happen in your life, be happy, celebrate. This is the paradox. He says, because the reward that waits for you in heaven is far greater than anything that you're gonna experience on this earth. When you work through these steps, you're gonna experience life like you've never experienced before. John 10.10 10 says that you're gonna experience life to the fullest. The, the message version says you're gonna experience a better life than you've ever dreamed of. And so these beatitudes, they're, they're a paradox, they progress, and then they're a picture of Jesus. Do you see that? That's a three-point sermon and everyone starts with a P, becoming a, a real preacher. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, I'm like the real guys now. And I didn't even mean that. And then as I was typing up, I was like, oh my gosh, what's happened to me? No, these Beatitudes, they, they paint a picture of Jesus. They, they don't just, Jesus just doesn't, just, doesn't just tell us how to live our lives. This is the, this completely encapsulates who Jesus was. Jesus lived a life poor in spirit, understanding his need for God. When you see Jesus going out and teaching, he's just as much spending as much time alone with God because he knows how much he needs God in his life. We see Jesus mourning and grieving over the state of the world and the people he met. Even some of his last words on the cross was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus' life exemplified what it means to be meek. Philippians says that though he was God, he didn't think equality with God was something to cling to. Jesus longed to see God's world set right. There's, there's these small acts of mercy and love to the, the hurting people. We see his heart and how he, he reached out and he loved people that other people didn't love. He lived a life of peace even up to the end when he got himself persecuted and killed. It was the Beatitudes that ultimately got him killed because Jesus continued to preach these ideals everywhere he went all throughout his ministry. And it was these words that he was preaching over and over again that eventually led to his death and then the resurrection. And it is through the death and resurrection that we see hope and forgiveness and life to anyone that is willing to grab onto him and choose to live differently. I mean, does this not, do you not agree that this is a better way to live? It's a harder way to live. And it, but I know that, that so many times we come in here and we talk about this kind of stuff and we're like, yeah, that's, that's difficult. But that's such a better way to live. But then we go back home and, we, and now we're, we're not living under a Roman society, but this American society that we kind of go back to and, and just kind of follow in those routines. You know, the phrase keeping up with the Joneses, where we just feel like we got to keep up with everybody else. This idea of keeping up with the Joneses, I read an article about it, how back in the day, it, it, I mean, it was a, it was, it was a big deal, but it wasn't as big because all you had to keep up with was your neighbor. If your neighbor mowed your, the lawn, then you mow your lawn. If the neighbor plants flowers, you need to plant flowers. If they buy a car, you should probably buy a car, kind of keep up with them. They, now with social media, now we're not just trying to keep up with our neighbors, but we're trying to keep up with everybody else. And we see everybody else and we're like, well, they look happy. In order for me to be happy, I need to have what they have. And now keeping up with the Joneses has taken up this whole new meaning. And we make our life all about trying to fit into this mold to be like everybody else when reality is it's, it's killing our soul. NBC did a study um, last year that says that Americans are the unhappiest they've been in 50 years. And, and you, they, they can attest some of that to, you know, the, the pandemic. But also of just constantly trying to keep up with other people, trying to live the life that, that we feel like we need to live as Americans. When in reality, the, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, it's telling us to live the exact opposite. You know, the, these, these verses are just as much for us today as they were to the people living in Jesus's day. 
Like everything you thought you knew about being happy, it's challenged right here. Everything that the world says is going to bring you satisfaction, that's contradicted in these verses. What I like most about the Sermon on the Mount, especially the Beatitudes, is that these are passages that we can hold up. And we can hold up to our own lives and be able to see, am I living this way? It's kind of a, a, check, a check sheet for us to be able to say, am I, am I poor in spirit? Do I mourn? Do I, am I a peacemaker? Do I hunger and thirst for righteousness? And so this is your challenge for the next few weeks as we go through this series. Is as Jesus, as we go through these teachings of Jesus, and we, we see that these really, truly are countercultural, I want you to hold this up to your own life and say, am I really living this way? Or is my life starting to look like the lives of everybody else around me? Oftentimes, I, um, when I read quotes or I hear quotes, I'll write them down on my phone and I have this folder. And I, I found this quote up here. And the, it says, we need to live lives that demand an explanation. We need to live lives that demand an explanation. If we're truly living this way, so countercultural, so upside down, our lives should not make sense to unbelievers. There's a, a rabbi, I wish I would have wrote his name down, but I, I read this. It says, essentially, the history of Christianity is the history of Christians trying to evade the Sermon on the Mount and avoid living the way Jesus taught. Think about that. How much of our life is spent trying not to live the Sermon on the Mount? As we go through this, these are going to be some difficult teachings. This is going to be some difficult ways um, to live your life. But just like Jesus said in Matthew 4, 17, we are called to repent. Not just repent when we first start following Jesus, but we're continuously called to change our thinking. But it starts right here, right now. It's kind of like this video. Take a look at this. I am a mistake. And I reject the idea that God defines me and loves me. I do not find my worth in those words. People tell me I am special, but they are wrong. It's a lie. I will be lonely forever and never find true love. They say that Jesus loves us and cares about us. This cannot be true because I am worthless. For so long, I believed in the distort idea that there is a hope and a future for me. Now I look around and it is evident. Jesus is not enough. For so long, I thought true love could be found, but now I realize that no one will ever love me. I used to believe that my life has divine purpose. I soon realized life is empty and meaningless. No one can heal the pain, the broken hearts, and the shattered dreams I have endured. God and his love failed. His love for me never existed. The healing, purpose, and love in my life I always sought was so far off. I have come to the conclusion that life is meaningless and has no purpose. I refuse to believe that Jesus loves me. When it comes to Jesus, when it comes to his love for you, Crossroads, when it comes to your life, your circumstances, can you go back to that video? Is it going to start over? Well, there was a, it wasn't all the way over. It's okay. Can we play that video one more time? Because we're kind of missed like the best point. <laughs> I am a mistake. And I reject the idea that God defines me and loves me. I do not find my worth in those words. People tell me I am special, but they are wrong. It's a lie. I will be lonely forever and never find true love. They say that Jesus loves us and cares about us. This cannot be true because I am worthless. For so long, I believed in the distort idea that there is a hope and a future for me. 
Now I look around and it is evident. Jesus is not enough. For so long, I thought true love could be found, but now I realize that no one will ever love me. I used to believe that my life has divine purpose. I soon realized life is empty and meaningless. No one can heal the pain, the broken hearts, and the shattered dreams I have endured. God and his love fails. His love for me never existed. The healing, purpose, and love in my life I always sought was so far off. I have come to the conclusion that life is meaningless and has no purpose. I refuse to believe that Jesus loves me. Keep it playing there. There we go. I mean, how many times do we feel this way and how many times do we need to reverse our thinking and change our perception? Jesus loves me. I refuse to believe that life is meaningless and has no purpose. I have come to the conclusion that was so far off. The healing purpose and love in my life I always sought existed. His love for me never fails. God and his love can heal the pain, the broken hearts, and the shattered dreams I have endured. No one life is emptyless and meaningless. I soon realized my life has divine purpose. I used to believe that no one will ever love me, but now I realize that true love could be found. For so long I thought, Jesus is not enough. Now I look around and it is evident there is a hope in the future. For so long I believed in the distort idea that I am worthless. This cannot be true because Jesus loves us and cares about us. They say that I will be lonely forever and never find true love. They are wrong, it's a lie. People tell me I'm special, but I do not find my worth in those words. God defines me and loves me, and I reject the idea that I am a Please stand.
Yesterday, um, just kind of making slides for this, I was able to to go through, um, going back to the artwork, all the the artwork that uh, Webster and Noble did, um, and just kind of trying to find the pictures and stuff. Um, it, you know, I got thinking their their art is nothing without the light. Like it, without the light, it's just this pile of trash that's laying on the floor or sitting on tables. But it's when the, the light shines through it that it goes from being trash to, uh, to being something of significance and beauty. And then you realize that there was something beautiful there all along. But again, it, it comes down to the light. You know, today, if you're here and you relate to those people that, that followed Jesus, the, the hurting, the broken, the outcast, the, the poor, Know that, that even though you may see yourself like that pile of trash, that garbage, that, that Jesus, he sees the big picture. The words of that song, not for a, a minute. Did Jesus ever look at you and see yourself the way that, that you see yourself? But you gotta know that it's up to you to let the light of Jesus shine through your life to go from the, the pile of trash, the broken and the hurting, to go through the way that Jesus truly meant for you to live. But that's up to you to repent, to the, this idea of metanoia, this idea of, of change your thinking, not just how you see the world, but how you see yourself. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for loving us. 
God, we, we read in the Bible that you, your thinking is not like our thinking. And God, for that, we are thankful. God, forgive us for the times that, that we look down on ourselves and we look at our lives and, and only see nothing but a pile of trash. But God, thank you for loving us so much that, that you're not willing to just accept that and leave us there, that you see us as something beautiful, something as meaningful, something to be able to be used in your kingdom. God, thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Jay. So thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us this morning, whether you're here and, or watching us online. For those of you that are here, if you checked a kiddo into the children's ministry, now would be the time for you to go and fetch them. Uh, got one, one quick announcement to make before you all take off, and that has to do with uh, today. Unfortunately, because of weather, uh, we are going to postpone our first road trip to Wildwood Park. Nobody wants to play in the lightning. Well, some, some might. And if that's the case, just parents put them outside for a while. Uh, but we're not gonna take that risk together. So unfortunately, because of the weather, uh, we're gonna postpone our trip to Wildwood Park. That's for elementary uh, age kids and their families. We're gonna postpone it until next Sunday. So next Sunday, we're hoping to uh, be able to go to uh, travel to Wildwood Park over in Granville, come back here to the parking lot where AIM uh, Jason and Ann's ministry is going to provide some ice cream treats for us. So unfortunately, families, we're going to back that up till next Sunday, okay? But also happening today, uh, it's the conclusion of the book study that the Ladies Bible Study has been going through. So for those of you that have been a part of that, tonight is the conclusion. So ladies, please be here at the complex at 6 o'clock. Uh, then riot will be happening next Sunday. That's the junior and senior high ministry. So next Sunday, that'll be happening. All right, we'll, we'll figure out how we're gonna make everything work. You know what, Jason was talking about, we can, let this, we can let the song go, you know it. Jason was talking about light and that reminds me. So you've got some homework. First of all, be reading the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew five through seven. Matthew five through seven. Second thing is, I need some flashlights. I need big ones. I need big flashlight. If you have a big, big flashlight, would you bring it to me next Sunday? I believe that's it. Congregation said, be the church, see y'all.